Comic books provided by Dronda Comics, Downtown Glendale, Arizona's premier comic book and toy collectible emporium. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Chaotic Fringe doing comic reviews. So we actually have five books this time that I'm reviewing but two of them are kind of going to be reviewed together just because of the nature of the stories involved. So let's actually start with them. There have been some comics in the past few weeks that have been in the mainstream one was on The View, one's been talked about a lot, and basically talks about the moral decline of society, blah, 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 blah. It's basically uh, Astonishing X-Men number 50 and Earth 2 number 2. Let's just call them, what the media called them, the gay issues. Now, um, here's the thing with both of them that is kind of the better thing to know other than what the mainstream media talked about. These are not solely about gay characters. Comic book people, of course we know that, that there's a story involved, but you never know who's going to come in and actually see these reviews, so you kind of want to clarify. These books are just not about the introduction of gay characters or gay marriage. That's not the main thing about these books. There's an actual story to them. Now, that being said, that's tar sort of the part where we basically say, okay, now here's what I hate about them or like about them. I would say of the two books, Astonishing X-Men was definitely the better story. Now, there's got to be a ca caveat with that because it's been a longer going story with North Star and his boyfriend and the marriage proposal. So... You have more history with that, whereas Earth 2 was basically, we're on a whole different world, we're introducing characters, and it's a, oh, by the way, uh, the person who will become Green Lantern is gay. Now, let's be honest about the Earth 2 story. The Earth 2 story almost seems like it was stuck into the book. I'm, I'm sorry I have to say that, that it... If it was supposed to be a momentous thing, I don't really see where it is that in the book. It's just sort of plopped in. But it also has to be understood that they are introducing characters in this. So it kind of makes sense that it seemed almost plopped into it. We'll have to see how it goes over the next few months if it's just going to be sort of a ploy or whether it's going to be an actual plot device. Now, that was entirely different from what was in Astonishing X-Men number 50. Astonishing X-Men number 50, it felt like that there was a history there, which, of course, there was. So when it starts off with, um, it was Gambit, Iceman, and Northstar trying to break into this facility, and they're basically talking about Northstar's love life as it is no big deal, that felt natural when the proposal happened it felt natural it felt like something that was there it felt organic it didn't feel like it was tacked in again i know it's the structure of the story that it's been a long going story thing but i would have thought with dc the way that it was introduced it could have been introduced a little bit better but I understand the limitations because you didn't have a whole lot of history to fall back on, which the X-Men story did. Now, I have to admit, Astonishing X-Men, I'm not a big reader of Astonishing X-Men, so that's why I still give it higher marks because me as an outsider not really knowing this particular book and this particular team, I came into it and got it. It felt like that they had been a team for a long time. It was no big thing about this, and it was something that was building as a storyline. It felt that way while reading it. Whereas Earth 2, again, being a new story, understand that it felt like it was plopped in with all the other stuff that they were plopping into the story. So as far as the big issue in those two, two books, Astonishing X-Men was definitely the better story. Now another book 
that is also a um, little bit in the mainstream, but it's more of a geek thing. And that is Minuteman number one. And this is the first book released of the revisiting of the Watchmen universe called Before Watchmen. Now, I was very adamant that I was not going to read the books. I, I was like, no, I'm not going to read them. Alamore did it. The whole thing, everything that the community has talked about, I was there with it also. And I was like, I'm not going to read this. I went to the store, saw the book there, and I said, you know what? It's kind of silly for me to condemn something without actually reading it. So I picked up the first issue of this book to see whether I might get the other books or how this book worked. The biggest problem I see the creators have in doing the Before Watchmen series is that it's coming after Watchmen. They're coming after Alan Moore in trying to do these stories. And it's not that it comes off as a crass, money-grubbing type of thing, but it comes across as people that are really, really trying to do the books right and just not making it. I would say it's very similar to the Watchmen movie, where you could tell the heart was in the right place. You could tell the person was really trying to capture the feel of the book, but it just, it missed it enough. It missed it enough that you noticed it. It was, it's going back to tell these different stories and especially coming out with the Minutemen, you at least were dealing with characters that were not a huge part as far as character-wise part of the Watchmen story. But you saw the little bits there of, of uh, Dwayne Cook really, really trying to capture that Alan Moore feel. And it's there, but not there. I think if he wasn't trying to do Alan Moore, it probably would have been a better book. And what I mean by saying Alan Moore, if you weren't doing Before Watchmen, if it were another book altogether, it probably would have worked better. But this has all the lineage of Watchmen attached to it. And it's trying to capture that feel, and I just didn't see where it was there. Maybe someone who um, isn't really familiar with the Watchmen books, and I think this is what this is appealing to, someone that's not familiar with the Watchmen, with the Watchmen book might pick up this book and the other books and find themselves drawn to actually read Watchmen. So in that respect, I think it will work. But for me, personally, reading this book, I pretty sure I'm not going to read any of the, of the other books just because I think I don't see where they have their own voice. It sounds like that they're trying to do Alan Moore again and that's where I'm not really good with the book. Next one, Justice League number nine. Now, Justice League has been one of those books that's been trying and it started off, to me, it started off weird with the whole five years in the past, and then it comes to the modern times. Number nine, as far as a comic book in general, I think it hit its stride. Uh, not that it's great, and I, and I know that like, sounds like faint praise, but it's not a great story, but it's a good comic book story. You read it, it reads fast, the action is fairly good, there's a villain that's introduced that seems um, going to be a heavy hitter. And the thing is, this one has, there was some visceral fear in it that I saw that I think is um, if they actually go through with the way it's going, you could actually have some really dramatic stories going on with it. So I'm recommending it, but I'm recommending it on a hope of things to come. If the next few story, if the next few issues are like this, where they keep up that pressure and actually build upon it, you could actually have yourself a really good series. Finally, I think with um, with Justice League, but right now it's just sort of like I'm hoping and I hope it goes. The last one is Action Comics number ten. Grant Morrison. 
you love him, you hate him. He's really good at doing weird stuff, but sometimes he gets too weird. This is a just too weird issue for me. I can't even begin to describe how utterly odd this issue is for me. It's, I can't even say it's good for a good sake. It just, it just seems a little off. And, it, and where it seems off is when you're talking about continuity with the other series, this is definitely not, doesn't seem that it's with the continuity. And I don't want to give away the event that happens in the book, but there is an event that happens at the end of the book that you kind of wonder how is he going to work his way out of it. But you're also at a point by the end of the book you don't really care. And that's not a good sign because it was an earth-shattering thing that happened, yet you're kind of left with, okay, what else is there? And the main story, and that was actually a side story. The main story was almost a throwaway story. I mean, okay, Craven the Hunter, I know it's not Craven, but let's face it, Craven the Hunter goes after Superman, and it's over. By the time he actually gets to attack Superman and does the thing, it's almost like one of those weird old Superman stories where it's like Lois Lane thinks she's found out who Superman is, but then Superman and Clark Kent are in the same room at the same time, and you're going like, oh, this can't be it. And then, you know, Superman basically chuckles until the next issue where he does the same thing again, and that's what this felt like. It just felt like cheap. So, so very interesting mix of books this time that I read, and... Uh, I hope you tune in again for the next review of books that I do on Comic Book Review.